Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Laura Ajege, your course lead for the MITx MicroMaster in SEM program here at MIT CDL. I'm very happy to be co-hosting this live event with Mr. Kellen Betts. Um, he's also a course lead here at the MicroMaster program, and you may know him already. And today we are very, very fortunate to have here with us Dr. Milena Janjevic, research scientist at MIT CDL, and she's leading the Supply Chain Design Initiative. Welcome, Milena. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We are excited to learn from you today. First, as you know, probably if you've been here before, we would like to know more about our audience. So I want to kick off this event with a poll. So I'm very grateful for having Chen helping us with a poll today. We want to learn why you're here today. We want to know if you're here just for net root design purposes, if you're very excited about that topic, if you want to learn more about the MIT CDL research initiatives, if you are more into technology and you want to learn how to use it on supply chain, or if you're all about optimization models, which is a topic we really love here at uh, the MicroMaster program. Um, so while we let that populate, let's go to Kellen and the agenda for the session. Awesome. Well, thank you, Lara, and hi, everyone. So for the next 15 minutes or so, Milena will provide some context on supply chain design, network design as a strategic strategic decision and share some examples of trade-offs involved in this process. Melina will also show us technology, how combining um, optimization, simulation, and machine learning methods enable visual analytics to better understand the end-to-end -end impact of our decisions. And um, then Laura and I will ask some questions after she's done with her presentation, we have prepared, and we'll definitely save time at the end of the event as well for your questions. And so please keep those questions in mind and get them ready. Um, and please use that webinar Q&A function, that little button on the bottom that says Q&A. Um, please use that Q&A function um, for those questions. And also be sure that you're logged in with a name. We won't be reading any anonymous questions. And so please be prepared to participate. We look forward to seeing your questions. And with that, maybe we can end our poll here and take a look at some of those results and share those results there. Awesome. So the question was, why are you here today? Um, it looks like you know majority of you want to see how visual analytics can help me improve supply chain performance. That's awesome. Um, also, majority of you, or more than half of you, I want to see, um, want to learn more about supply chain network design in general. That's great. Um, also, you know, similar result for I want to know more about um, using technology for decision making. Um, that's awesome as well. Um, and great to see many of you in our MicroMasters programs who don't miss any of our events um, as well. It's always fun to see that as well. Awesome. Anna Melena, if you have any thoughts on that first poll result or not. Yeah, so uh, interesting results. I hope I'll, I'll be able to uh, give you at least some of the uh, answers to some of these uh, hopes that you are all having. Um, I'll touch upon the visual analytics and network design in general, and then um, I would also love to to hear your questions at the end to uh, to see if there's anything uh, we we've missed and that you want us to cover. Uh, so yeah, uh, interesting to have a, a, such a motivated audience. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, with that in mind, Milena, are you ready to kick things off with your slides there? Yes, yes, yes. Let's let's do it. So let me share my screen. All right. So you should all be seeing my screen. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I will present in the next 15 minutes or so um, some of the work that we do in the supply chain design initiative um, around visual analytics um, in supply chain network design. Um, so just say a quick reminder of what do we mean uh, when we say supply chain design, uh, as probably most of you know, in supply chain management, uh, we have various levels of planning, strategic, tactical, operational. Um, when we talk about supply chain design, we are really at that strategic planning level and we are making decisions such as configuration of our network, uh, number of facilities, um, what suppliers to use, how to coordinate flows between facilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so typically, when you think about these strategic decisions, they have a, a very uh, high return on investment. And uh, therefore, uh, I'd say supply chain design is probably one of the most critical uh, areas of uh, supply chain uh, planning. Um, now, uh, when we design a uh, network, um, we basically need to consider uh, some trade-offs. And obviously, I cannot list all of them here, but um, 
just to give you an idea of the type of things that we need to consider, um, here I took one of the decisions that is, I'd say, a very critical and important decision to make, which is how many facilities we have in our network. And I've analyzed, okay, how does that decision on the number of facility impact various areas of uh, performance? So on the left hand side, you can see that, you know, as I am increasing my number of facilities, my uh, inventory costs are uh, increasing, but not in a linear fashion. I can see a slightly different trend in terms of transportation costs. So when you talk about inventory, when you talk about transportation costs, we are here really in the realm of typical uh, things that we consider uh, in supply chain plan. However, if you look at the right hand side, you can also see um, two additional metrics. One of them is the response time and one of them is the market share that are slightly less traditional uh, and that are not considered um, as frequently in um, supply chain um, uh, topics. So as I'm decreasing my, uh, increasing the number of facilities, my response time is uh, in decreasing. And then in some specific industries, for example, if you think about e-commerce or e-fulfillment, um, that will uh, of course uh, drive market share and ultimately drive the revenue. So ultimately, if I take this very simple decision, which is the number of facilities, I can see that both on the logistics side and on the business side, there's going to be uh, various impacts on the performance. And so what I'm basically trying to do is design a network in such a way that it is going to balance between the ability of the network to capture the revenue and the ability to keep our logistic costs uh, under control. Uh, and so it's a, it can become a quite complex problem. Um, to solve that problem, there's a variety of uh, things uh, that we can do. And um, first thing that we can do is obviously uh, use various um, uh, analytical tools. So um, I think that you've talked about optimization models uh, quite a bit uh, in the courses that uh, are within the MicroMasters. But there's actually uh, various uh, types of analytical approaches that uh, we can uh, use. Um, I'd say the most basic one is using some descript descriptive analytics where we're basically looking at data and trying to figure out some trends and patterns based on what happens. So for example, try to analyze how the demand shifts and how that will impact our network. We can also use uh, predictive analytics uh, where this is typically in the realm of machine learning where I'm trying to basically anticipate what will happen. So basically I'm looking at historical data, for example, and trying to derive what would be the future of the demand. And then we can use prescriptive analytics, um, which uh, are the focus of operation research methods and optimization models are uh, a great example of uh, this type of analytics. So we basically have this toolbox of, of things that we can do. We have all these various uh, type of analytical tools that we can use um, either uh, separately or combine them together. And now the question uh, comes, okay, how do we select the best tool? How do we select the, be the best decision support uh, for our specific problem? Now there, uh, one uh, basic premise between the uh, supply chain design initiative that we just kicked off at um, uh, MIT CTL is that analytics are only going to be useful if they can actually help us drive better decisions in organizations. Um, and when you think about it, uh, if I take a given model, let's say an optimization model, and I get the results of that model, well, solving a model is not the same as solving the problem, right? And so if, uh, for example, the results of my model are not understood or accepted by decision makers, if they don't drive actual change in the business environment, well, then that model is actually not going to be uh, very helpful. And so what we do in the supply chain design initiative is uh, we basically try to create ways for humans, for decision makers in the organizations to interact with our models, to gain better understanding of what's driving these decisions, uh, build consensus and basically allow 
a, a higher transparency between the model and the solutions that are being um, proposed. Um, few things that we do here. Um, one of them is um, visual analytics. Um, so visual analytics at the most basic level uh, serves to analyze different data and to create uh, a better understanding, common knowledge uh, among different decision makers on what are some of the issues and what are some of the problems. And that is especially important if you take into account supply chain design, where we saw there are impacts on costs, but there are also going to be impacts on uh, revenue, on market share, et cetera, et cetera. So if I consider this problem and if I say, well, there are basically impacts that go beyond what we uh, typically consider, consider in supply chain management, I actually need a way to engage with a much broader audience. And that audience is going to be stakeholders from finance, stakeholders from marketing, from sales department that can also uh, be uh, important uh, decision makers in these supply chain design uh, initiatives. Um, so that visual analytics basically allows to kind of create a shared situational awareness, uh, to share knowledge and basically create a, an agreement of what the problem is. Um, the second thing that we do is we use what we call human in the loop analytics, which is basically allowing uh, interfaces between our models, quantitative models, and the decision makers through uh, these interactive uh, interfaces. So in the example that, I'm, uh, that you can see here on the slide, um, you can see one screenshot from a uh, visual analytic uh, uh, tool that we have developed. And in this specific case, um, it turned out that uh, indeed the proximity to uh, the um, uh, customer was a big uh, driver of market share. And so the company basically was trying to understand how many warehouses they need to locate throughout the US in order to capture most of the demand, but also keep the costs under control. Um, however, they did not have a clear idea on what the uh, relationship between that proximity of the demand and the market share would be. And so what we did there, we incorporated into the analytical tool uh, this type of slider, the, the demand slider, where basically decision makers can define these different functions and see how sensitive the model is, see how sensitive the results are uh, to the type of function that they have defined. Uh, so this basically allows you to understand if the type of solution that you get is robust or is very sensitive to the uh, inputs that you are considering. Now, to give you one example um, of um, how we perform the, uh, this type of uh, visual analytics in a very concrete case, um, I will take an example of a project I worked on recently where we had one global manufacturer um, that was basically launching a new product uh, in a new market, and they were trying to decide between multiple uh, channel strategies. And so they were considering three channel strategies, uh, home delivery, traditional, or direct um, transportation, where basically they would bypass a number of, of steps. And these are shown here on the um, uh, chart. And so what turned out is that in their decision to basically um, design their channel strategies, there were a number of elements that um, were important. Some of those elements uh, were quantitative elements, such as costs and inventory, and those are the things that we can typically uh, model and simulate or uh, through our different uh, tools. But then there were additional elements, for example, customer service level, customer satisfaction, that were more of the qualitative nature. And so uh, what we did is uh, we basically uh, made a tool that allows to simulate the performance of these different scenarios, and also that allows us to make trade-offs between these different dimensions of performance that can be qualitative and uh, quantitative. So as a first step, um, if I go into the simulation part, you know, again, you can see there's going to be a visual app where I can build my scenarios, define different parameters, et cetera. 
And ultimately, when I perform that exercise, I end up with something like this. I have my three scenarios here, and I have my four KPIs here. And then I basically get a number uh, which gives me the performance of each scenario according to uh, each KPI. Now, in this specific case, what you can observe is that none of the scenarios is all green or all red. So, for example, my traditional scenario has the best performance in terms of cost. My home delivery scenario has the best uh, performance in terms of service. Now the question becomes, how do I decide? How do I make trade-offs between cost and service level? How do I choose when I am facing a ambiguous situation such as this one? Uh, now here, the approach that we have uh, put in place is basically to allow decision makers to define the weights that they give to the different scenarios. And so in our visual analytic tool, uh, we will have, in addition to a pane that allows us to build different scenarios and define the parameters, we will have something that will allow us basically to adjust the weight that we give to different uh, metrics. And so I can say, for example, I, my, my cost is the most important. I will give it 70% and then everything else 10% of uh, importance in my final decision making. And then we basically engage with the company, we engage with the stakeholders and we say, okay, what is your uh, assumption on what those weights should be? And this is a purely subjective um, discussion. And how does that basically impact the recommendation that we get out of our um, uh, system? And so we ran a bunch of different uh, uh, simulations here. And so, what we did here is we said, okay, there's really two things that are kind of key in our decision making, and that's going to be the, the trade off between the cost and the service level. And so we basically ran this exercise by varying the cost, um, um, the weight of the cost between 100% and 0%, and same for service level between 0% and 100%. So it kind of ended up with a with a, a grid that gives us a various ways of prioritizing uh, different objectives. Now, in this specific case, um, when we ran that, um, what we were able to obtain is for each of these scenarios, a kind of a composite score, a final score that now takes into account all of the different weights. And what you can see here is that in this specific case, basically, unless I am in this very extreme areas where I only value cost or only value service level, the moment I am in the middle and I'm considering a mix between these different objectives, I have a direct path that is the most recommended one. So my model is actually not that sensitive to the type of inputs that I need to um, put in here in terms of uh, the weights. And so with a great level of confidence, I can say that the direct path is actually uh, our preferred path. Uh, in other cases, we will get a much more um, sensitive model. And so for example, we will then need to really pay more attention in, okay, are we putting 20 or 25% on one criteria or the other? But in this specific case, it didn't uh, uh, really matter. So um, as a summary of this diff very quick presentation, so um, we have some trade-offs that we need to consider when we are designing our supply chains. Um, we have a lot of different analytical approaches here. I've talked about simulation optimization, machine learning at the beginning, but there's there's others um, that can act to support the decision making. Um, however, we believe that creating intuitive interfaces to these analytical approaches is really what is going to help us drive decisions in organizations. And there I've mentioned the role of visual analytics, uh, the uh, role of human in the loop analytics, 
Um, ultimately, it comes down to saying that the quantitative models and analytical approaches are decision support tools and not decision making tools. Um, when I'm facing a complex strategic problem, such as supply chain uh, design, um, that's not something we can simply outsource to a machine. Uh, there's always going to be uh, a human intervention that is needed to uh, account for all the, uh, uh, the things that uh, we need to incorporate in our decisions. So with that, um, I would, um, if you would like to learn more about the approaches that we put forward in our um, uh, supply chain design initiative, um, I would invite you to go on our website. So um, scdesign.mit.edu. Um, and on that website, you find a summary of what we do, but also you will be able to um, download a, a white paper that we just published. And that white paper was um, built uh, with collaboration so, uh, of Coupa, who is a provider of uh, artificial intelligence um, and has extensive uh, knowledge in supply chain design. And so we really sat together uh, a, and collaborated on kind of uh, putting together what we see are some of the most common challenges that companies are facing and uh, what would be some lines of action, what would be some opportunities to address um, in the future years in terms of supply chain design. Uh, so if you go on the website, you, you scroll down, you can see you can download the white paper. And um, uh, if there is uh, anything there that is of interest to you, please uh, feel free to reach out and uh, share your thoughts and uh, ideas with us. And uh, that will be all uh, from uh, my side. And now I believe... Also, Milena, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. It was short, but it was very insightful. So thank you for um, all that you have shared with our audience. Uh, I find it very interesting, this topic about uh, the human in the loop interfaces. Like we talk a lot about technology and how important it, it's becoming and when it comes to decision making, but the expertise and the knowledge of those experts that we have in every field will definitely bring the best insight out of any model we create. So it's very important that you bring this to us and that we share that with the audience, because at the very end of the day, like as you said, and as also Dr. Kabli says in some of our lessons, um, people is the one uh, th that's making the decision, like not the models, people do make decisions. So that's very important. Thank you for bringing that to the table. Absolutely. And one of the challenges and now to like go a little bit beyond what you just said, but touching up that those topics, one of the challenges that company face a lot when creating this optimization models or any decision-making model relates to the number of variables you have or to consider when analyzing these trade-offs or um, the constraints they will have, how much of that complexity should they add on mm -hmm. their models so that they are actually bringing good decisions? Because you can incorporate as many things as you want, but that doesn't mean you will drive a better result out of a model. Uh, so would you share some more about that on what you've learned on your research? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, indeed, I think uh, one of the biggest challenges that we, we, we find when establishing optimization models or other models as well is um, how do we make choices? How do we make right choices to reflect the business decisions, decisions that are at hand? And when you think about it, when you when you design an optimization model or any other decision support tool, there's a number of, of things you can do. So um, first, you you can define the scope of your of your model. So I can say, well, I'm only looking at a regional level, at a, one region, one country, or even one city, or I want to have an end-to-end -end supply chain design model where I look from the supplier of the supplier to the customer of my customer. Uh, so that's the first first choice that we need to make. Um, the second choice is going to be relevant to how granularly are we basically describing each of the components of that model. So for example, you know, how granular am I in the description of my flows or the facilities or the processes? Um, you know, one example there could be, I can say, well, I can just take my customers and locate it in a given city and consider that to be a single point or I can consider 
uh, a model that incorporates routing decisions towards each individual customer in my uh, city. And there I can have, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of vehicles performing hundreds of routes per day. And I would need to incorporate that as well. Um, and so uh, ultimately, there's a trade off there. Uh, so if I have a very large scope of my model, I'm probably not going to be able to be as granular. Um, and that's for two reasons. The first reason is going to be the solvability because we still don't have computers that can solve an, a full end-to-end -end, uh, uh, supply chain design model with that level of granularity, but also for practical reasons because simply it would require us to gather too much data and uh, wouldn't um, be uh, practical to drive the decisions. So then the question comes, okay, I can have a wide scope or a narrow scope. I can be very precise in terms of transportation, inventory, um, uh, production planning, et cetera, et cetera. So how do I decide what should be um, part of my model and still keep it within a uh, range that is feasible and that um, I can implement in uh, the time that I have at hand? Um, now, there, um, I'd say uh, what I've seen is that a lot of companies uh, start by using kind of generic approaches where we say, okay, no, a typical supply chain design model is looking at transportation costs, inventory, et cetera, et cetera. And that's good if you have a generic supply chain, uh, but uh, if um, you really want to uh, use your supply chain as a source of value creation there, it really comes down to identifying what are for your company the main drivers of value, the main drivers of cost, and really focus your model on those areas. Uh, so, you know, if I'm in the pharma space, I will probably have very high uh, cost of inventory. I will probably have uh, very high service levels that need to be insured. And so that's something that needs to be translated in the features of my model. If I'm uh, in the e-commerce space, there probably I really want to make sure that my last mile part is going to be properly modeled. But it's really coming back to, okay, how can supply chain design drive value and how can we best design our model to reflect that um, for our organization? So that will be, that, that will be my, my advice. Thank you, Melina. That's great advice. I really love what you just ended there on you know, kind of focusing on the business and instead of you know, using more generic models, really using a model that's um, focusing on your industry or your particular network design um, and utilizing some of that business understanding and some of that business context rather than just kind of a generic model. And maybe that also kind of then goes to the concept of, you know, that requires a lot of human intelligence, if you will, you know, human understanding of that supply chain. Um, but something that you also mentioned briefly in your presentation was this, was the concept of machine learning and AI, you know, so that, you know, com computational intelligence or that artificial intelligence, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you could maybe just touch on a little bit more on, on the use of and how AI comes into this context, you know, for that predictive and that prescriptive um, stages, how AI and machine learning come into these models um, and visual analytic app that you built. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I would say the most immediate application of machine learning and AI um, in supply chain design is going to be on the model inputs. So when we uh, design a given model, uh, that model is going to take in a large number of inputs and those inputs can be, for example, relevant to the demand, it can be operational metrics, it can be uh, the costs of different elements, et cetera, et cetera. So there's going to be a very, very large number of inputs, number of parameters that we are considering. And um, what we see typically is that um, traditionally um, companies um, have used very approximate values of those uh, parameters. So for example, you know, if I'm designing a, uh, a, a regional supply chain uh, and I need to consider the cost between a point A and B, I will simply look at my historical data and say, well, you know, on average, uh, last year it has cost me, I don't know, uh, that many dollars per pound to connect those two points. And I will use that as an input to, to my model and then design my model uh, uh, with that in mind. Now, um, what we've seen is that um, in a lot of cases, if you take that very simplistic approach where you just basically approximate uh, 
uh, uh, in such a rough way some of these input parameters, uh, that can lead to huge errors in those parameters. So typically, you know, if one, ex one project that we worked on, we looked at uh, that approximate approach where we take the average and then we compared it to the, to the, to the real cost and we, we could see the differences were up to 60% of the, of the real cost. Um, and so obviously, if you if you are working with this type of inputs, the recommendations that you're going to get outside of from your models are not going to be very valid because you're, you're not putting uh, accurate assumptions. And so I would say the first rule of uh, machine learning or AI is really making sure that the inputs that we're considering are uh, correct. And here, for example, in the case that I've just mentioned, what we did for that company is we built a machine learning model where we looked at a bunch of different features such as you know, origins, destination, you know, GDP of a country where we depart, GDP of the country where we arrive, uh, the weight, the carrier, the time of the year, et cetera, et cetera, and, and came up with a much more uh, granular description of the freight cost. And then we use that as an input to our uh, optimization model. Uh, and that obviously yields much better results in the long term. So I would say that's the first um, uh, application. Now, some other application that I, I don't think I'll have time to touch upon today are basically replacing a part of your um, model with an AI component. Um, and that can sometimes allow us to decrease the complexity. And then a third one would be basically using AI to analyze uh, the range of solutions that we have obtained. And so trying to understand basically better what's driving the results of our optimization model if um, uh, using um, AI. So there's a, there's a number of options. I think it's a really uh, interesting area to explore. It's just starting to, uh, to develop. Uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to see what comes out in the next uh, few years. Thank you, Milena. And I would like to switch gears to, to touch a little bit on a topic uh, uh, I know many of us in the audience could be interested in. And it's thinking on the sign-in for sustainability. So mm -hmm. you mentioned the tools we can use, you mentioned the trade-offs we have, variables we can consider, constraints or levels of complexity. And, and you touch upon the service level as one of the qualitative aspects you include on the model. I would love to know if you can use the same tool and the same approach to design for a, a more sustainable network. Can we optimize on those terms? And if you have seen that done, what would you recommend or suggest? Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, um, I think there's a, there's a definitely a few ways in which you can um, approach the that problem. So um, the first approach would be, you know, something uh, similar to what I've just described where we, we have a, a limited set of alternatives that we consider. So in, in this case, we had three different options for our channel strategy. And we have a number of different uh, dimensions of performance. And you know, those could be expressed through uh, quantitative or qualitative KPIs. And so I can have you know, cost service level, environmental impact, uh, social impact, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and then there, uh, you know, we, we basically draw from the multi-criteria decision um, making um, uh, field. And what we do is we basically analyze uh, how does the weighting of the different option impact the recommended solution that, um, that we get. So that's kind of one way and that's, that's very much in line with the example that I've, I've shown. Um, now, um, the second um, approach is um, to basically embed different objectives in our optimization problem. And so uh, there, rather than solving for a given solution and then assessing it according to the multiple dimensions, we are basically embedding in our objective function the different uh, uh, performance dimensions. And so there I can, for example, have now an objective function that will have one component that is cost, one component that is environmental impact and one component that is um, a service level or something like that. Uh, when we end up with that, with that type of objective function, I would say there's basically two ways in which we can um, uh, uh, solve for it. Um, the first one would be to say, okay, I can bring everything to some common measure, some common unit, 
Um, so for example, that common unit would be cost. And I can say, well, I can convert one uh, uh, ton of CO2 into a dollar amount, or I can convert a percent of service level into revenue and therefore into a dollar amount. Or I can you know, use a different measure of, of utility or something like that. And in that case, if we do that, uh, what we basically end up is uh, with a just slightly more complex uh, objective function, but where we now still have a, a single objective that we are solving for and that now reflects a multitude of different subcomponents that we have predefined. Um, so that's the first approach. Now, the second approach is to basically not um, convert everything to a single unit, and that can be either because we don't we don't know how to do it because it's sometimes not not exactly clear cut what is the translation between a social impact and a cost uh, or you know uh, service level and additional revenue or it can happen because we don't want to do it because we want to keep those trade offs explicit and there we will basically come into the area of multi objective optimization where we are now explicitly in our objective function considering uh, uh, various uh, uh, dimensions that now are not um, at the same level. And that kind of allows us to, to keep those trade-offs more explicit. And I think from decision-making perspective, it makes sense because now the company is the one that is deciding, okay, you know, how much value actually I'm putting at my environmental impact versus cost and not just using uh, a standard that they might not be aligned with um, to start with. That's awesome. Um, I, that's definitely an area that I'm very interested in, you know, is incorporating sustainability and some of these concepts in. So to have those two different strategies, you know, either multi-objective, if you will, and or trying to convert it all into a single objective function. I think that's a fascinating concept. And I know kind of trying to keep an eye on time here. We're getting pretty close to you know, wanted to pull in maybe some questions from the audience. So maybe we have time for one more um, question here, Laura. I think we have prepared and maybe building off a little bit on what you just mentioned, um, you know, where you kind of may have these two different strategies. And so the one um, question might be, well, then how do you evaluate the effectiveness of each of these different strategies or more just more generally, how do you evaluate the, the success or the effectiveness of a model? Um, mm -hmm. And so are there KPIs, are there strategies that you have um, in mind where um, you used to approach this, this concept of, you know, evaluating the effectiveness of a different strategy or a different model? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I would say uh, the, the most uh, elementary way of uh, evaluating the model would be to say, well, I'm looking at, you know, my expected performance, I'm looking at my actual realized performance, and I'm, 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 I'm trying to assess what is the gap and I'm trying to basically see, okay, how accurately were, was I able to model uh, my uh, business problem in hand. Um, however, I would I would be careful with evaluating uh, the, the quality of the models as such, because we know that models are always going to be wrong. We know that they are always a very simplified version of the reality. And so those KPIs should serve more to basically monitor um, the success of the model within our supply chain design process. So the objective is not to develop the best model. The objective is really to put in place a process that allows us to monitor how successful uh, our modeling was, what areas should we focus on and reiterate on that and basically have a continuous loop where we are continuously learning from the implementation and um, allowing to adjust our assumptions, adjust our scope, adjust our modeling approach, uh, or adjust simply the environment in which we are operating. And so I would say that it's the, the success is more going to be in that adaptability of the supply chain design process over time, rather than coming up with one uh, uh, model that is going to uh, serve us uh, until the end of times and be uh, completely accurate. And by the time we develop it, it's probably already going to be obsolete and we'll have to renew it. So um, it's more about that continuous design process that we need to be put in place. Thank you, Milena, for bringing that. And you're already answering some of the questions we have in the Q&A feature because we have this on how often should I review or revisit my network design. So thank you for bringing that. Um, before going to the Q&A with the audience, I would like if Chen can help us launch the second and last poll just to see 
where we are, what you have learned today from Milena's insight. So while we let that populate, and so to learn um, what are you taking away from this event, I would like to go to Tarun Kumar's question. So I'm summarizing it because it bring a lot of different topics, but I wanted to know um, based on Tarun question, um, how do you treat outliers and how accurate a model can be when we have situations like the pandemic or a trade war? How do you incorporate or not the outliers or how to decide treating them? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, like, let's let's think just about um, incorporating risk and uncertainty, for example. So, you know, I, I have two different types of uncertainty and risk I can consider. I have my business as usual, where I say, well, my demand is going to, you know, vary between 80% and 130% um, over this period. And, you know, I'm going to put in my play in, in place a model that is going to account for all of those different scenarios, that's going to account for the probability of those scenarios. And basically I'm now looking at a way of maximizing the expected value over a range of scenarios, which are all within a given business as usual range, let's say. So that will be like one approach to, to treating where we don't have these outliers. Now, what happens if we have you know, global pandemic of what happens if you have a, a very high disruption, et cetera. So there, uh, the problem with that approach is that if I take the same approach and I say, well, I have 0 0.01 probability that I will have this catastrophic event happening, um, that is basically going to get lost in my, uh, 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 in my solution. The, the probability is just so low that um, I'm not going to actually account for that in the type of solution that I'm getting, even though the, the impact might be uh, catastrophic. Um, and so th there I would say what I would combine, uh, what I would do is I would combine the previous approach with more of a scenario planning approach where you're explicitly looking at some of these catastrophic scenarios and you're trying to understand how robust your model is. Uh, to uh, those specific scenarios. Um, and, and, and there it really comes down to uh, how do you define those scenarios, uh, who defines those scenarios, and what should be the ones that should be uh, incorporated. And you know, what might happen is that you, you might end up with a model that is you know, slightly less uh, um, um, uh, cost effective in your business as usual range, but that is maybe much more robust in terms of those very high disruption, but you need you, you you almost need two different ways of looking at the problem um, to be able to um, come up with uh, with a recommendation that will be robust against two types of um, uncertainties and, and solutions. It's a great um, answer. I love that answer just because it kind of reinforces this concept of bringing in the human, you know, the human in the loop in the modeling process, but also just the, the focus on the analytics serving the purpose of decision making really bringing in that human side of it. Because um, these models often like machine learning models, for example, are often built on historical data and if something's really low probability event, historically, it's not going to predict that to be very high probability in the future either. And so you got to bring in that human intuition and that human um, insight. So that's a fascinating, fascinating answer. So maybe if we could just end our poll real quick here and we'll um, take a look at those results and then we'll pick maybe one or two questions here to wrap things up. Um, so again, the question was, and what was the most interesting part of today's session for you? Um, and so you know, thank you again for everyone who answered. We have lots of um, answers to our poll here. So appreciate you um, providing the answer to our polls, but it looks like many of you are interested in expanding your knowledge just generally in um, you know, network design, which is awesome to see. Um, understanding how technology can enhance collaboration, which is um, awesome to see as well. It's very interesting. Anna Melena, if you have any any thoughts on some of those um, results of that poll there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is, uh, uh, I, I think understanding techno how technology can enhance collaboration in supply chain, that's a, that's a very, uh, it's a, it's a very wide topic. I think we could uh, probably spend uh, uh, not uh, one hour, but uh, f several days discussing that. Um, I, again, I, I, I'd love uh, if, for those of you who get a chance, if you can download the white paper and read some of the, the, the things we've put there and, and come back with any thoughts you have. And it's, uh, uh, I, would, I, I would love to hear your feedback and uh, learn from your experience uh, working in company and organizations that are uh, 
actually performing this, um, how does this relate to you and um, what are some of the things you, you find uh, uh, are interesting or are missing? Uh, so uh, I invite you to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Milena. We do have one more question, if you are okay with it. We, we are on time, but we don't want to leave the audience without sharing some of their questions. Um, they want to learn about um, how to design for reverse logistics. Do you have any recommendation on including reverse logistics? Do you plan for it in advance or you just incorporate afterwards when you need it? Uh, what, what is it that you learned so far on that? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question. It's a fascinating topic and uh, it will really very much depend on the type of reverse logistics system that you are putting in place. Um, I think the, the one of the key differences um, in the reverse logistics systems to our typical uh, supply chain design is that uh, we are now incorporating a um, much larger number of stakeholders and actors that are uh, often uh, outside of the organizational boundaries. And so, you know, if I'm, if I'm for example, taking um, reverse logistics for plastic uh, bottles, et cetera, I will have, you know, obviously the company that is ultimately going to be using those, but then I will have a you know, a network of processing facilities uh, located throughout the country that is now under the public uh, uh, governance. And so it's, I think, how do you establish that interface between the those different uh, supply chains that are actually uh, connected, but often governed by different bodies? That is the one of the, the most uh, interesting topics uh, to me. Um, in other cases, you know, a company will have a much more, um, a, a much more control over its entire supply chain, including the reverse logistics. And so there, the question is basically, how do you just extend the current model to, to incorporate these reverse flows? But I think depending on the type of situation you're in, you, you'll get a very different, um, uh, you will need to have a very different approach. So, yeah. That's fascinating. It's definitely an area that I'm very interested in as well as reverse statistics. I think there's lots of opportunity there. Um, and but and we're running very short on time, but maybe Laura, if you have one time for one more question, it's probably a pretty quick question. And it really kind of summarizes, there's a number of, of questions in here. And I'm just kind of grouping it all together. It should be pretty quick, but you know, a number of learners seem to be very hands-on. They're very interested in what tools you're using. You know, so what software you're using for some of these you know, models um, and the visual side of the models as well. So I don't know, maybe if you have any tips or, or tools um, that you might be able to share. Sure, sure, sure. So, I mean, basically the, model, the, the tools that we develop, there's always going to be a front-end part, which is um, um, basically developed on a framework uh, that is developed by the Computational and Visual Education Lab, the CAVE Lab um, uh, at MIT CTL. So they've developed basically a framework that allows us to visualize all kinds of network data and other things as well, and that we are heavily uh, using in our in our projects. And then on the back end side, um, it's going to be uh, typically Python and then uh, solvers um, that can even open solvers or Groby or whatever you want want to use. But um, basically, those would be some of the tools that we're using. Thank you, Milena. So we invite everyone to check the Cave Lab and the Supply Chain Design Initiative at MIT CTL website. It, you will find it there if you look for it. Um, we appreciate your time, Milena. Uh, with us today, we learned a lot and we are sure our audience is taking a lot of great insights out of this um, event. We want to remind everyone that this is a webinar series, so it's not only the first live event for SE2X and SE4X, but it's also a webinar series. So we look forward to having you all joining us. Um, Kellen and myself will be hosting those two um, coming next in also technology and connecting with network design. Um, I don't know, Kellen, if you have any final words for Milena and our audience? Yeah, Melina, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you sharing your insights. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for participating in our event. We have lots of questions here, way more questions than we have time to answer. Um, I appreciate you sharing your, your questions and your participation in our polls. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Melina. We'll have you again soon, I hope. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.